everyone. So we saw that the atmosphere keeps the planet warm for without this blanket of gas the earth would be freezing cold. Let's explore how this magic happens. The atmosphere is very very thin in the scheme of things. If we were to draw it to scale then it will just be like a thin borderline, like a pillow sheet. So to show its properties while retaining the spherical shape we will have to disregard the scale. It's dense at the surface, but the density declines exponentially with height. The red dots represent oxygen and the other light blue color represents nitrogen. By volume, these two gases cover almost 99% of the atmosphere. The greenhouse gases that play a major role in trapping the heat are a very insignificant part of the atmosphere. Let's enlarge the picture so that we can see the decreasing density more clearly. And as mentioned before, if we were to draw it to scale, then the whole atmosphere will shrink to just a thin line. And for that very reason, we won't show it to scale. The pressure also declines exponentially. The temperature should also hypothetically decline as one goes up, but it doesn't. It experiences ups and downs. Let's pick a position on Earth. As one goes up, the temperature changes. Let's draw a temperature scale so that we can see the range of temperature. And let's mark the points at which the twists and turns happen. Again, the heights of the points are not in scale to the Earth, but the relative distances between them are to scale. As one goes up to around 11 km, one experiences declining temperature. It then doesn't move much, so temperature remains stable until about 25 km. It then increases until about 50 km, after which it starts declining again until about 80 km, and it then starts increasing again. It can become really hot as one goes further up, though as we saw, the air is very thin there. So higher temperature, that doesn't mean the same thing that we experience here on the ground. Now this is just a stylized example and the actual temperature doesn't follow straight lines so the actual observed temperature might look something like this. And it varies with season and position on earth. For example in winter, the surface temperature will be much lower and there could be inversion near the surface as well. However, this stylized pattern is representative of the average profile and quite informative. To understand this vertical structure of temperature, one has to delve into the composition of the atmosphere and the distribution of light by wavelength and of course the interaction between the two. Firstly, the gases within the atmosphere are well mixed except that the water vapour is mostly at the lower layer, whereas ozone is concentrated in the second layer and we shall see this layer is called stratosphere. And at the very top there are lighter molecules, but other than these differences the gases are well mixed. Now it takes two to tango, so we need to look at the radiation. We saw that both the sun and the earth emit radiation, but each of them emits radiations across a whole range of wavelengths and this density is given by the Planck function. The density of a black body equivalent of sun will look as follows. The two vertical lines mark the range that our eyes can sense, the blue, green and red. So you can see the peak emission is in the visible range and this range covers just under 50% of the total sun radiation. To the left of the visible range is the ultraviolet and then x-rays and gamma rays, dangerous stuff. And to the right of the visible range are the infrared, which have larger wavelengths than the red, and then microwave and radio waves. So it's not just the radio stations that send radio waves, stars do too. The x-axis represents the wavelength, which obviously is increasing to the right, but it would probably help to visualize the wavelength, so tilting the x-axis slightly for focus and assuming the wave here looks as follows. 
Then as one moves to the left, the wavelength decreases, which means the frequency increases, or you can say the radiation waves to the left are more energetic. If one decreases the temperature, then the distribution goes down and moves to the right. The decrease is quite sharp, so we can't really see the two distributions when plotted on the same scale. Remember, the temperature is only 288 Kelvin, but that's what the logarithmic scales are designed for. So let's plot the distribution using logarithmic scale. And now we can go all the way down to 288. We can now connect the knowledge of the atmosphere and the distribution of the radiation by wavelength to explain the vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere. We will offer a simplified explanation as the actual dynamics are a bit involved and there's both cooling and heating happening everywhere, but we will focus on the most significant elements at each altitude. Let's consider a small quantity of light from the sun. We saw its distribution by wavelength. It was actually the distribution of radiation from a black body equivalent, which is an idealization. The actual density is slightly less more than looks something like this. As this light reaches the top of the atmosphere, the very short wavelength radiation is absorbed by oxygen molecules and hence the temperature of the region goes up. Also, the air is very thin so there is less loss to space. It then gets cold as the light has already been stripped of the very short wavelength radiation. The light then reaches the ozone layer which absorbs the medium wavelength UV light so the region gets hot. And as the light gets stripped of these medium UV lights, absorption decreases and the temperature goes down. The light then reaches the region which has high concentration of water vapor, which in combination with other greenhouse gases absorbs some specific ranges of the longer wavelengths. So the temperature starts increasing. The, the primary driver of the temperature and the lower region is the emission and latent heat transfer from the Earth's surface as it gets warmed by the sun. Let's have a quick look at what happens to the radiation emitted by the Earth. The surface temperature varies by location and it varies within each location, for example with season and time of the day, but it would look something like this. Now the absorption by the atmosphere will need to be approached slightly differently as the atmosphere also emits within the same range. But we know the temperature profile of the surface and the atmosphere so if we could see the profile of emission towards the top of the atmosphere then we would be able to deduce what wavelengths of the Earth's radiations are absorbed by the atmosphere. Nimbus 4 provides such data which we use. If there were no atmosphere, then the emission profile at the top will be similar, except for dilution due to increase in area. But Nimbus 4, which captures a slightly narrower range, shows that the emission profile looks something like this. Again, it varies with location and by day, but we are after the general pattern, so the exact numbers don't matter. As we can see over this window, very little of the Earth radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere except for this band which is attributed to absorption by ozone based on its properties. This band to the right is mainly attributed to absorption by carbon dioxide. The regions in the wings, the upper and lower, are due to absorption by water molecules in its different forms. Over these ranges, you can see the profile resembles that of a cooler body close to freezing. For example, here is the profile of radiation from a black body with temperature of 275 Kelvin, which is about 2 degrees centigrade. Looking at the vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere, we see this emission originates from the lower part of the first layer which makes sense because that's where most of the water molecules are to be found, as we mentioned earlier. So water absorbs the earth emission and then emits according to its own temperature, which is lava. 
and the ozone and carbon dioxide bands and the middle or even lava then this 275 kelvin lines so the emissions from those bands occur much higher so the atmosphere is highly selective when it comes to transmission it transmits most of the solar radiation but absorbs most of the earth radiation and most of the outward emission to space is from the atmosphere itself which is generally cooler than the surface or less dense where it's hot so the transmission proportion to space is much lower and don't forget these gases in the atmosphere emits both sideways upwards and downwards so they send some radiation back to earth as well finally let's quickly discuss some dictionary stuff these temperature turning points define the different atmospheric layers the bottom layer is called troposphere tropo is a greek word which means turning mixing so this part of the atmosphere sees a lot of movements by the way the same greek word when combined with energy generates entropy now actually this troposphere is not really circular its height is higher at the equator and lower at the poles so it looks something like this its height is also not fixed and changes with the season the top of this layer is called tropopause as we shall see the top of every layer carries the same name it's just the sphere gets replaced by pause Above the tropopause is the stratosphere, it's much quieter and whoever ends up in the stratosphere gets stuck there for a very long time, though there is some circulation there and the variation in the circulation there can have significant impact on the lower layers. The name stratosphere is derived from the same strata one sees in statistics and is used here because it's highly stratified and hence very resistant to vertical movements. And yes, the top of the stratosphere is called stratopause. The next two layers are called mesosphere and thermosphere. The thermosphere is characterized by heat and very large distances between molecules, meaning the air is very thin. Meso, of course, means middle and thermo means heat so you can see where they get their names from and above the thermosphere is the exosphere which really means the outer parts of the atmosphere and by the way the part of the troposphere close to the surface is called boundary layer and that's what we breathe and pollute we will stop there i hope you enjoyed the video and i look forward to seeing you in the next